Good, mo good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our service. Welcome to uh, anyone watching online now or later, and especially welcome to visitors. It's lovely to see you. Um, we have an expectation this morning that God is going to do something really good for us, and uh, that is quite exciting. And so we pray that uh, our expectations will be high and uh, our hearts are open to realise the joy that is in the Lord is our delight and our strength. In Jesus' name. Please stand for the opening of our worship. Let's sing to our King this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father. Father, and praise the Son, praise the Spirit now with us. Every moment, all our days, God be praised, oh God be praised. Praise God with morning's breaking light. Revelation 5 verse 2 says, <clears throat> And I saw a mighty angel claiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll 
but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He was able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which were which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. He, he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign forever on, uh, on the earth. Lord, we just give you all glory for you are the one and the only one, Lord. And we are just so thankful for everything it is that you have done for us. You were the lamb that was slain. You are the conquering king. And we just bow down before you and all of the glory and honor goes to you. And all the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. And all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. Let's sing that again. And all the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. And all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all, Jesus. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. And all the saints and angels, they bow be before your throne and all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing you are worthy of it all sing to him today you are worthy of it all Jesus for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory he's worthy of all the glory you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all sing to our jesus for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory let's sing that chorus again you are worthy of it all all thou praises lord you are worthy of it all take our hearts lord we belong to you for from you are all things and 
to you are all things. You deserve the glory. so kind. You are the giver of all good gifts, Lord. We trust you and we know, Father, that you are the provider. So we give to you everything, all glory, all honor and praise. You are worthy of it all, Father. So we just have our hearts open and we just pray, Lord, that you would pour out and that you would just give to us, Lord. And we know, Lord, that you are a kind and a good king. So we just trust you, Father, and we lean into you today, Lord. We just praise you and we just give you all glory. Yes.
for your knowledge of us and Lord that you have revealed yourself to your people. Lord we bless you. We pray all of these things in Jesus name. Amen. We've been on a journey for multiple years around this whole idea of how we make disciples and therefore how we build a discipling culture. We looked around the world at world's best practice. We looked at Jesus and into the scriptures on what was happening and really what God is doing today. Ultimately, we've sought to become practitioners and not theoreticians. With building a discipling culture, we are working with people, we are working with church leaders and we're helping people set up their own language and practice. We're helping churches actually begin to secure traction. That the whole idea of making a disciple, of discipling somebody towards faith in Jesus and then well beyond is something that's highly achievable. There are certain practices that have been developed that are implementable even by children all the way through to highly qualified executives and professionals, we are seeing it happen. And what I really want you to understand and actually to believe is that it's possible in your situation as well. Good day everyone, from October 3 through to October 10, we're gonna be taking up an offering for the BDC ministry. We've had an original small group cluster of about six or seven people, but about nine people have participated in the last 18 months. We now have a second group uh, that is uh, just started as well of about seven people. Let's hear a little bit about what others have experienced in BDC. Hi everyone, the way that I've been impacted by the BDC program is that I now realise that I don't have to be an extroverted person in order to share my faith with other people. It can just be as easy as having an existing relationship and asking them a simple question. Uh, I've also learnt through BDC how to discern who in my life I can share the gospel with and I've been really encouraged by the stories and experiences from other people in the group. I joined the BDC cluster early this year. The two main things I think I've learnt would be how Jesus discipled people to faith and then once they had come to faith. And then the other is connecting with friends, uh, just getting to know them, finding out who they are and then finding opportunities to share Jesus with them, perhaps through reading the word together. Well, I think it's given me some common language for understanding evangelism. Uh, the idea that you know, looking for a person of peace, being someone that like listens and serves you, was a concept I'd sort of tried to develop myself or um, come across the idea of but never actually had um, consistent planned out language so they're just about a hundred steps ahead of me so it's really helpful to actually be able to pick up from other people's experience and wisdom in about how to go about asking someone to read the bible with you uh, and how to do that in a way that is really non-threatening but also how to teach others in that as well not just do it yourself i've loved jesus for a really long time but it's not until recent years i've realized i'm not doing the important things he's asked me to do go making disciples that make other disciples We've looked around at other churches to find someone who will even think about this important life that we are called to live by going and making disciples. And we found Coro and BDC and so grateful for Simon's passion to obey Jesus in making him known to this very needy world. Yesterday my sister said to me, we've got 19 people in our church, George. We used to have 30. We've got a wonderful pastor and preacher, does everything. And I thought, how can that be? We've got this wonderful gospel, but uh, ordinary Christians sometimes are afraid to share that. But here at BDC, we're being trained to connect with people in our lifestyle, get to know them, relate to them, and in a natural way, share our faith and love them. Ever since I became a disciple of Jesus, I've just wanted to share the life transforming good news uh, with others. Uh, for a long time, I hadn't really known how to do it. Uh, BDC is really a, a coached Bible study where we just follow the ways in which Jesus trained and equipped his disciples. And uh, we discover that the Holy Spirit is already at work. And it's been wonderful to see the types of conversations I've been able to have with, with others. We're going to be taking up an offering from the 3rd through to the 10th. You can pick up a little envelope like this if you uh, want to give cash or um, a, a cheque. If you would like to uh, just give online, you can go to our Corrie Uniting forward slash, slash give page, select BDC in the drop down menu, and you can give online in that way.
clearly the BDC program um, links with our church uh, vision of people focused on Jesus and uh, we encourage you to contribute. The zero figure showing in the uh, slide that was there is not the figure that's recommended uh, in case you were wondering and if you could uh, keep that in mind the, the service is offered free to the church and it's really to facilitate the ongoing ministry of the people running the BDC program with our church to uh, run the same program with other churches so it's a wonderful ministry um, uh, today uh, right now normally uh, it's a holiday school holiday time and a long weekend so the number of the children are somewhat depleted but for obvious reasons but Coro juniors have a holiday session right now Coro kids if you're here you have activity bags which will be brought to you our Persian brothers and sisters stay in the service and uh, we have some exciting things to happen coming right now Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Simon Dent. Uh, you've seen me on the screen. Now I'm here in the flesh. Um, it's a great um, opportunity for, for us this morning just to uh, acknowledge and give thanks to uh, the people who have been a part and continue to be a part of our church. One of the things that we really want to make sure that we do... G'day, Ilya. <laughs> um, one of the things that we want to really be able to do and do better is to honour the people who uh, have been called by God to, to serve amongst us or be a part of us. And there are some people in our congregation who are no longer able to be here because of, of health reasons and there's uh, another, some others who uh, are, are leaving to, to worship at our local church. So all right, firstly acknowledge uh, Roger and Margaret Litchfield. Um, we, many of us will know uh, Roger and Margaret. Uh, Roger served as a, a treasurer here for, for many years and uh, Roger and Margaret together have uh, been foundational to uh, the life of our church for so many years and uh, they're no longer able to physically get with us uh, at the moment. They're still a part of our church community uh, but we just need to acknowledge that you probably won't see them around at, uh, at church um, but they're still very much a part of us. Now, I know that they're watching online, so uh, bless you, Margaret and Roger. We, you're still very much a part of us, and uh, we just thank you for all that you have done in uh, serving and, and worshipping with us over many, many years. We'll say, yeah. I'd like to uh, also invite Ray and Jill at Elford to uh, come forward. Who'd like to, to come and join me at the front? Um, Again, people that you will know well if you have been with us for some time. If you uh, are new to us at Coro, uh, Ray and Jill have been uh, with us for, for many years. Ray, 50 years. Uh, Jill, not quite so long. Come up and join me at the front here, guys. Welcome. Thank you, Simon. Um, Ray, I'll give you that one. Uh, now, Ray and Jill, you've both moved recently to uh, a, a beautiful little unit down um, uh, uh, Port Rush Road, and you're going to be worshipping at Malvern Uniting um, coming forward. But we thought it was just a great opportunity just to say thank you for all that you are and have uh, been at Coro as well. But, Ray, just want to get, you've been doing some thinking about something that you'd like to say. What, what would you like to, to say? Well, um, it's interesting that uh, where we moved to, is uh, on Port Rush Road, um, St George's, Burnside, and uh, it's a long way from here to there. But the old uh, church I was brought up in from when I was a baby to the age of 23, when I got married to Betty, um, that's only about five minutes away, three minutes away. So we've started going there, and uh, Tim Hine is the minister there. Uh, interesting, they have a big pipe organ, fascinating. 
and they put together new songs and old songs with a pipe organ and trumpet. It's something we rather like, actually. And Peter was drooling about that. The other day, <laughs> no pipe organ here. Um, so we, we started worshipping there, and um, for me, it was a bit like going back to my old spiritual roots, where I was brought up, came to faith, uh, mainly in Arthur Jackson's ministry, and uh, was nurtured there. And also, um, my gifts were perhaps uh, climbing poles and putting lights up and running square dances and that sort of thing. I was able to do that. And uh, I became a youth leader there under Arthur and Jackson's ministry and came to Coro here uh, some years later and lo and behold, Arthur's here again and I'm his youth leader. So, and then, of course, then the Alford line carried on and Mark here and my son, he was youth leader here too. Um, so for me, it's um, a church which nurtures and people can come to faith and use their gifts and find a place of hope and, and a loving community and family. And uh, if I can just go on and say something. Most of you will know Jeff Hill. He is a walking miracle. Last week, he went into hospital with a heart attack. Four stents all completely blocked. It really, you know, he, he didn't think he was going to survive, but he's ready to go anyway. Mm. You know, he, yeah. he's, he knows the Lord. And lo and behold, they put two new stents in, took the two new old ones out, I think, and I spoke to him on the phone yesterday, and he's home again. Yeah. I mean, praise the Lord. Mm. And I want to say something about Jeff. Now, Jeffrey, when we see each other, he says to me, G'day, Brother Ray. And I, G'day, Brother Jeffrey. And there's a few good people like that, and that's more than a community in a church, it's family. Yeah. Now, he's not a blood relation, but... We both know the Lord, and somehow or other, there's that uh, connection, connection <laughs> in a deep spiritual connection. And, and my hope is that Coro continues and builds on that. It's a place where people can be nurtured and come to faith and use their gifts uh, for the glory of the Lord. Right, That's thank what you, I'm right. My heart at the moment. Yeah. Jill, is there anything that you'd like to say? Yes, thank you, Simon. Um, when Ray and I contemplated getting married, I was rather frightened of him because he was the sort of pillar of the church and he thought I was just a boring businesswoman so we weren't <laughs> going to get very far at first. Both wrong. But we were both wrong and I think that I am very envious of Ray's time with church family because I was brought up in Matabili land which is southern Rhodesia in those days um, where we didn't have much in the way of a local church but my father was a wonderful teacher and preacher of the word so I grew up with dad then went to boarding school. So it really wasn't until I came here that I suddenly realized that there was another dimension and that is this wonderful belonging. And a couple of highlights, one of which was that in 2000 there was a dramatic problem in Zimbabwe and all the farms were taken. And so we put together an organization and Mike Chalk was part of that and he's here as well. Um, and trying to get them jobs here, getting them into Australia. And Dean said, why don't you bring your first families in? So one day we brought in 12 people, uh, two families with their children, and they were the vanguard of another 316 families who came. But their welcome to Coro was absolutely mm, fabulous. Right. And I think the other one that was a great highlight was the antiques getaway, <laughs> or just the get oh, the getaway, name, which um, name tags on. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because it just worked. We needed something for older people. I was not prepared to sleep in a swag any longer, and this fitted us yes, perfectly. Perfect. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's been wonderful, and I have loved being here, being on the eldership and uh, taking part in the music and, and the prayers and becoming part of this family. Yeah. And we're not leaving you totally, as you understand. Yes, I, I understand <laughs> that. And you, you've both served um, just in all sorts of different ways uh, in the church. Ray, uh, you and, and your first wife, Betty, yeah. uh, just really foundational to, in, um, I guess, my faith. I remember uh, I first met you before I was a believer 
and um, I came along to church on Sunday and after I became a believer, one of the things that you and Betty said, there's something in your eyes that are different and I'll always remember that. Uh, and it just, yeah, yeah. Um, it confirms in some ways the change of life in the spirit for mm-hmm. somebody mm-hmm. when they discover um, who Jesus is and the way that Jesus changes lives. And I think yeah. your witness in all of that has been really foundational, not just for me, but for, for the rest mm-hmm. of the church mm-hmm. uh, with Betty and, and Jill, your witness in terms of, uh, you're willing to sacrificially serve others, works of justice, um, has been really influential for me as well. Mm. We'll need to wind this up, Ray. Why you... Well, we just want to say yeah. that um, we look forward to what God's got for us. I mean, people say, at 88, Ray, you're crazy. You shouldn't be thinking about further work in the church. Well, we, we just believe the Lord's got ministry, further ministry for us. Uh, when we go to Melbourne... And uh, Tim Hine, the minister, said a lovely thing. He said, you've had many years of long, rich service at uh, Coromandel Valley, Ray. In the last few years, you have with us, uh, we pray that will be as rich as you had at Melbourne. So we're looking forward. We th- even think there could be a, a Melbourne Coro getaway. Who knows? Yes. And a, a, a joint. What a oh, wonderful thing that would be. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, they're both a bit keen about that. So we'll see what develops that, but we we still just want to be what what the Lord wants us to do. We've had a very tough last 12 months. We were stressed where we were, Uh, and uh, we know what it is to um, be under that, but to be under the Lordship of Jesus, particularly uh, reading the Psalms every morning. And and, (laughs) there are David writing a lot of these Psalms. He knew all about these enemies and people who were trying to... all sorts of. So we felt one with them, but but, uh, we found... A, a, a new release and coming, coming back here. It, it's just coincidental in a way that right here now we've just moved to a new place. Uh, we've, we've relaxed. Uh, everyone says we're looking 10 years younger. Yeah. Uh, or France have gone. And uh, so it just went. By the way, it's just lovely to have uh, my sister, Alison, mm. uh, uh, old Malvinite, of course, uh, and then my son, Mark, of course, who's yeah. a preacher at Seeds. Great. Well, Ray, we'll um, invite you to lead us in in prayers for others. But before we do that, let me just pray for you both. Yeah. Uh, Father, we just bless you for the gift of your spirit. Uh, Lord, that you have uh, saved us uh, in your son, Jesus Christ. You've brought us to new life and in bringing us to new life, you also bring us to a new family. And we thank you, Lord, for, for Ray and Jill and for their ministry here over many years. Um, and Lord, we pray a, uh, a blessing upon them as they uh, find a new home. Uh, we, we thank you, Lord, for Malvin, and we ask, Lord, that that may be a really fruitful time in their lives and their ministry and uh, in their relationships with others. Lord, we are so thankful for your grace and for your church, and we um, yeah, bless you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you. This morning, um, every Sunday night, Jill and I go to London, All Souls, Langham Place, and it's their morning service, but we're online. And uh, we've been blessed by the ministry from that church, a very strong Anglican, about the same size as uh, Alpha Church, Holy Trinity, Brompton. Um, And we've always been impressed that every Sunday they have prayers of confession. So, look, this morning... I want you to lead in that, and there'll be slides coming up. But before we do the first, the first slide is there, I want to say this. That when we come to God in prayers, of, we're confessing things, and, and we're looking for um, that, uh, our time that, that uh, we're going to be forgiven, we need to remember that it's Jesus' work on the cross that makes that possible. In Scripture we hear, it's grace we are saved, not by what we've done, the gift of God. Now, what's the gift of God? The gift of God is Jesus. And so you say it's by grace we have been forgiven. Not of ourselves, it's it's Jesus. And so we come this morning with great gratitude that we can be forgiven for what Jesus has done on the cross. Now, let's just take a moment and just in our own hearts, just reflect and just ask the Lord, bring to mind the things that we have done, we shouldn't have done, 
hurts, all sorts of things, and we're going to confess those things. Just take a moment about it to think about that, particularly those online. Now, these, you'll see the, on the screen um, where it says, all you will, and I'll do the leader part. Let's all together say, our compassionate Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins. This is my lipid. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have sinned against you and our neighbours in thought, word and deed, through negligence, weakness and deliberate faults. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes, faithless and not believing. We confess our weakness and unbelief. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have failed to extend kindness and generosity where it is most needed. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us. And we have lived in this world alone and doubted our eternal home with you. In your mercy, forgive us. And if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins together, we have the wonderful assurance we can take from 1 John 1 9. Let's read this, say this together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We are forgiven. Now, just in prayer, there may be some here today and those online who have been harbouring for a long time uh, all sorts of shame and things have done, shouldn't have done, maybe terrible things you've done and people have hurt you and we do and these have affected us and we do need to come to Jesus and say forgive me for harboring these thoughts for having done those things I have never confessed them now this is the time right now to confess those things and ask forgiveness it's a great word from the cross that we can say we are forgiven. And so let's repeat those words again all together. We are forgiven. Let's say it again. We are forgiven. So we can walk free, free of the past, knowing that we are forgiven people for what Jesus has done on the cross for us. We trust him to the uttermost. Amen. Good morning. Um, today's reading is from John chapter 7, verse 53 to chapter 8, verse 11. Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered round him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, 
Those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Glennis and, and Ray, for giving us such a, a perfect intro to my sermon and this, pet, this message. Um, it's very much what we've just read is in some ways the biblical warrant of everything that Ray has prayed. So thank you, Ray. Um, let's pray and we'll ask Jesus, who is present amongst us by spirit, uh, to come and just reveal himself really truly to our hearts and minds this morning. Let's pray. Father, we just do bless you. And we thank you, Lord, that you um, have sent your son uh, to save us. And in sending him to save us, Lord, that you speak to us, you reveal your truth to us, and you show us the way to live. And so, Lord, we are hungry for that word, that power from your spirit, uh, but also the, uh, the, the joy and the way in which you call us to live. So, Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I was about 15 when it was my turn to cook tea for the family and um, I thought I'd do a really lovely spaghetti bolognese, not just this one from the can, I'd actually make it myself. And so I followed this recipe, uh, got all the mints, got everything all going. As I was going, I followed the recipe and it said, a pea of salt. I thought, a pea of salt, it's just the letter, P and salt. I thought, now what could that possibly be? A pea of salt. And I started thinking of all my measurements that I knew. A pint. Obviously, it's asking for a pint of salt. And so I was thinking, well, is this a standard pint or an imperial pint? I wasn't really sure. Anyway, I'll just go with the pint glass that we've got. And so I went and grabbed the salt out of the pantry. And so there's only a very small container. So sure, no, there's no way near enough for that. Fortunately, in the pantry, there was a bigger container of salt, one of the big ones. And I could actually take the lid off it and I could fill up the pint glass with salt so I could really follow the recipe truly. And then I uh, put it in the meal, served it up on the table. It was all ready to go. One of the other lessons I learned actually at this time, always taste the food before you serve it. But anyway, so we sat around the table, my masterpiece in the middle, Everybody really hungry, ready to get into it. The spoon, they're blending all of this fantastic meat on their pasta, which was al dente. Um, and they started eating. And as soon as they had a mouthful of this, they started running from the table from water as though somehow I had poisoned them and they were about to die. And they said, how much salt did you put on this? And I said, I followed the recipe. It said a pea of salt. Surely that's a pint. It says, it's a pinch of salt, not a pint of salt. You're trying to kill us. The, the, the point of that story is that getting the right measure is really, really important. And I think in some ways we look at this story and the difference that Jesus makes in terms of... Um, how we are to, uh, to live in the, in the freedom that God calls us, the way we measure that reality is vitally important. And this whole story about Jesus and the Pharisees and the teachers of law come to spell that out really quite remarkably. It is one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible. It really is the, the heart of the gospel. Firstly, we might want to look at the, the setting. It is in a temple. And that in itself is significant because it's actually saying something. Where do we go to meet with God? All of us are made for a relationship with God, whether we know God or whether we're a religious person or not. Ultimately, the very inner longing and being is us that we would actually know God and be reconciled to him. Whether you have that language in your head or not, that's the basis of what it is to be human. 
to actually be in relationship with God. And the temple for the people of Israel was this place where they would meet with God. And here we have Jesus, the Son of God, uh, the, the Word who became flesh, uh, that God himself uh, present amongst the people, hidden in just the, the human frame of Jesus, is actually here in the temple, this place where people would come to meet with God and Jesus himself is there. God himself is there in Jesus Christ. But the context is also around this debate around what we call the law or the law of God. You remember that Moses was given the law of God and say, this is the way my people are to relate to me. There will be blessings for obedience. There will be curses for disobedience. And so the Old Testament uh, saints would have the law very much a part of their, their hearts. We just need to follow and worship God truly and God has given us his law. But the whole debate around how we use the law is a part of the foundational question, how do we live in a right relationship with God? We long to know God, but we also want to live in a right relationship with God. And uh, the law was very much a part of that. So we have this moment where the Son of God is, stand, is, is in the temple sitting down. There are people gathering around him, hearing what he says, as though he is, himself is speaking the very words of God. Funny, because he is God uh, amongst them. Um, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, hidden in human flesh. No one ultimately recognised him as such. But in the quietness of this very early morning, where they're all gathered around, um, the most horrific and brutal scene plays out. Particularly brutal for our modern ears. A woman who's been caught in the very act of adultery is dragged before Jesus and made to stand before him as a convicted criminal, if you like, standing before a judge waiting for sentence. And they've been dragged there by the religious leaders, those who upheld the law. And they actually come because they actually see that Jesus himself is a lawbreaker. And they don't actually care about this woman who they are dragging before them. They don't even actually care about the law. Otherwise, the, the, the man who has also committed adultery would also be standing up before them. But they use this, this poor woman and the law as a way of accusing Jesus so they can reveal him as a fraud. And so they bring this test before Jesus and they say, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses... Uh, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? Let's go there. We move the next slide, please. Sam, this is working again. What does God say? What does God say about our sin? What does God say about the evil that is so prevalent in our world, uh, in ourselves? The Pharisees, in many ways, were very right about upholding the law. They were right to be concerned about God's holiness. Uh, to live by grace is not to live without a law, or indeed to avoid the consequences of the law. Where would we be if there was no law in the world, even in the civil law? If there were not those who were able to actually make, uphold the law, the world would be chaos. How much more for the very law of God? That's right, for them to be concerned about the law. Uh, they speak of Deuteronomy 22, 23 and 24. If a man happens to uh, meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, you should take both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. The young woman, because she was in a town, did not scream. Uh, if, she, if she did not scream for help, and the man, be, sorry, let me read that again. The young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife, you must purge this evil among you. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, in some way, say, Jesus, you've got nowhere to go. The only place you can go 
is condemn this woman in the same way that she should be condemned. If you are from God, you will condemn this woman in the same way that God's holy and righteous law will condemn this woman. But Jesus does something quite remarkable. Jesus bends down and starts to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin throw the first stone at her. And then he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Here we have God, the Son of God, the Holy of Holies, the one who actually gave his people the law, the one who stands near this woman who is a clear sinner and he stoops down to actually be in her level to be where she is. But he also puts his finger and he writes on the ground. Now what on earth is Jesus doing here? There's a range of things we may think about that and many commentators have different opinions. So what I say is I think biblically valid but in many ways we don't really know what Jesus was intending uh, when he did this. In Exodus 31, 18, uh, we read, When the Lord had finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. By this action, Jesus, the Son of God, stands before this broken woman who is a transgressor of the law, deserving of the full weight and the wrath of God, actually stands down to be with her and actually writes on the ground with his figure. Effectively, he's saying to all around him, you do not know me, you do not know my father, you don't even know the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is actually to lead you to me. Because the problem with you, the problem with this woman, is not that the law is not good, but that you can't fulfil the requirements of the law yourself. You need a saviour. It's a really interesting passage in Hebrews chapter 7 we were reading in our Bible um, reading yesterday morning. It speaks of a priesthood, one who comes and stands in between God and the people to, to lead the people in worship. And it says, For when there is a change in the priesthood, there will nece necessarily be a change in the law as well. Jesus stands as the great high priest, the one who truly is the one who knows the Father, who can truly represent the Father in all holiness. And he stands with this broken woman and he says to her, you will only be able to fulfill the law of God through another high priest who is going to represent you. So Jesus stands with his finger writing on the ground before all of these people saying, I'm not going to present, just present God's righteousness and holy. I'm going to stand in your place as well and do what you cannot do yourselves. Fulfill the law on your behalf. Jesus, as the high priest, is present with this sinner as he stoops down to be where she is. Jesus has stooped down to be where you are. And by his death and in his resurrection, he will take on all the righteous requirements of the law for her and for us. So the judge of the whole world looks upon the accusers around him and says, if any of you is without sin, let them be the first one to cast the stone. And he goes back down again on the ground. The older ones walk away, followed by the younger one. They know that if they seek to condemn this woman on the basis and the standard, the measure of God's law, they will also ultimately be condemning themselves. Uh, Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, No one will be justified in God's sight by works of the law, for the law merely brings an awareness of sin. R Paul knows that the law is not necessarily given that somehow we will actually attain a, a measure of righteousness and right living ourselves. The law is actually there to show us that we can't do it and we need somebody else to actually stand in our place. And this is what the Son of God is actually revealing to this woman. Romans chapter 2 says, 
You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you pass judgment, do the same things. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, Jesus is saying to us, he's saying to the, 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 the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, if you want to use the law, the measure of right and wrong, by the way in which you measure others, that's fine. Just know that God will use that same law to measure yourself. Which measure are you wanting to use? Are you going to judge others according to their behaviour, their right standards? Are you going to judge yourself according to your behaviour and your right standards? Or are you going to judge yourself according to the measure that God calls us to measure one another by? And that is by his grace and the life of his spirit. I think this is what Jesus is saying. After teaching the disciples about how to pray, he says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Essentially, he's, Jesus is actually saying as he's teaching about prayer, we can measure one another according to grace and the forgiveness that God himself has given to us through Jesus Christ for the whole world and we live in the joy and the liberty and the freedom of that, particularly in our relationships with others. Or we can live judging one another and choose in some ways not to forgive them and therefore we move to a different measure of the way in which judgment happens and the Father himself ultimately says, I'm going to judge you according to that measure as well if that's the way that you want to go. There's no life in that. And the disciples of, of Jesus are called to recognise that. The religious ones were stuck in their dilemma and they walk away leaving Jesus alone with this woman. And we get to one of the most striking dialogues in all of the scripture. Jesus says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus, God present in the midst, comes down and stoops to the level of a sinner. He stoops to your level and he stoops to mine. And because he knows he is the gift of the Father who is actually going to take the judgment of the law upon himself for you and for this woman, he can say truly and honestly to you most boldly, neither do I condemn you. Is that not the most liberating good news that the world has ever heard? This is the reality of what Jesus is actually doing when we preach the gospel and we, 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 we hear the true word of God to us. Those of us who are forever judging ourselves according to the law. Those of us who live in a world that is always going to be judging one another according to a measure of the law. And yet Jesus comes down to where we are in the midst of all of our shame and our brokenness and our sin, our very real transgressions against God's holy law what he has done for you he stands before you whether you are a believer or not a believer in Jesus Christ neither do I condemn you because I'm going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself it's the gospel it's the gospel that everyone is commanded to believe and put their hope in what is the gospel that Jesus would rather condemn himself than condemn you. Is that not a staggering thought and reality? Those of us who are aware of how far we have fallen from, the, from, from what God expects of us, that Jesus comes in love, that he would rather see himself condemned on a cross than you be condemned. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, John three seventeen, 
but to save the world through him. Do we believe it? You have the permission to live in the fullness of that by trusting in those words. But Jesus continues the conversation. He also says to this woman to whom he says, I do not condemn you. He says, now go and leave your life of sin. It's important that she hears the word that she is not condemned but it's important also that she understands what it means for her to live uncondemned. Uh, it's living under condemnation of the law that prevents us from ultimately living in the freedom of a holy life. When we hear this phrase, now go and leave your life of sin, it's not a sense that we now actually go back and now we're going to try harder this time. This time I'm not going to go back to all of that stuff. This time I'm going to actually live in obedience to God's law and I'm not going to slip over. And as Jesus is saying, well, you're just using the same measure that I'm telling you not to use. I don't want you to use the measure of the law because you'll always find that you are a sinner and you'll always live in shame and guilt because of that. The measure I want you to use is the measure of grace. Clothe yourselves in the blood of Christ. Put on the new self, the Holy Spirit that actually comes to bring a new life of your union with Jesus Christ and his righteousness and his holiness. And by the power of faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can live a new life. It's not about trying to put your sins away. It's about putting on Jesus Christ and living in, by faith in him. Revelation chapter 7 tells us of uh, the saints that will actually come at the, the, the last days and they'll be those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Titus tells us that he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews tells us, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience in order and our bodies washed in pure water. Isaiah chapter 1 says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be made like wool. So Jesus says, Go now, leave your life of sin. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through just Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has now set you free from the law of sin and death. It means that all of us now may live by a new law, not the measure of the old law about right and wrong, but the new law, which is the law of the Holy Spirit, the law of grace that tells us that you are in Jesus Christ. All that has happened to him in dealing with the issue of sin and the law is now given to you through grace. And you may have the freedom to walk as Jesus himself now walks, in the freedom of an, um, uh, an indestructible life, the word of Hebrews says. It means you can live by the law of the Spirit. You can know God, free from condemnation, washed perfectly clean of all of your sin and shame. We need to remember that daily. Uh, let's get practical. Apostle Paul says, flee sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians. I'm sure Jesus would be saying the same thing to this woman. Uh, Paul says certain things about the dangers of sex outside of the marriage covenant. He says it's actually more costly than any other sin in terms of uh, the damage it does to an individual but also to others. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says every other sin a person commits is outside the body but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. We could say to those who are caught in sexual immorality, just stop it. And I think in some ways that's a good thing uh, for people to hear. 
it is a, um, in the first instance, maybe the thing that needs to stop the bleeding and the destruction that it causes. But ultimately, even that law becomes powerless. What we need is a new life. And it's a life that the Holy Spirit gives to us as we walk in our union with Jesus Christ. And in walking in our union with Jesus Christ, the Spirit may indeed call us to adopt new ways in which we might live. It might mean that some of us might need to set up intentional practices about healing, uh, about hearing from God, about regularly actually hearing the gospel, putting us in that position where we can be reminded again that we are no longer those who are actually bound um, by, by sin, but we've been born again and made new in Jesus Christ. We have a new life. We need to hear that time and time again because the default of the human heart is always going to draw us away from living in that reality of grace. It may mean that some of us need to have some intentional relationships that we recognise we can't do this life alone. That's why it's so important that we regularly come to church I know there are many people who are choosing and said not to actually uh, come, come to church and there is a concern in that for me because we get drawn away from living the life of grace and we get overwhelmed by all sorts of sins and, and struggles in life. We need to hear the gospel and we need to have intentional relationships where we can encourage one another and people can speak truly to us, bringing the truth of the new life to us in a fresh way. I know no other way of overcoming temptation than picking up our freedom that comes through Jesus' words, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. It's the measure that God uses upon us. And it's the measure that we're called to use upon ourselves and upon those around us. If we do, we will see far less loveless judgmentalism in the church that we see in the Pharisees and more resurrection love and hope and far more evangelism. More knowing Jesus, more worshipping of God and more being embraced by God in order to live a new life. It is a grace that saves, but it's also a grace that divides. Living in grace is not always easy. It may demand hard choices, a willingness to die to ourselves. Whether we be the ones who are sinners or whether we are the ones who are sinned against, the gospel will evil humble us to our knees so that we realise, say, all that I have is yours, Lord Jesus, and you know the life that you want to give to me. Grant me this grace so that I might walk in your, in your spirit and your power. Or we could hear that message and we say, no, the Lord demands justice and I will not um, hear this word of grace. So I ask you, what measure of grace will you use? We are called to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and measure everyone, even ourselves, on the basis of this grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, again, another hard word. We know, Lord, that your law is holy, but, Lord, we know that we are unholy. We know, Lord, that uh, you demand righteousness and truth because that is life, that is your love. And Lord, we recognise that in ourselves we are completely powerless. But we are those who stand with this woman, aware of our sin, only to look to see that the great high priest, the Son of God, has stooped down to be at our level and taken on our humanity. And that God himself has rescued us. That God himself has washed us clean of our sin that stains and so easily clings. And that God himself now has joined himself to us by his Holy Spirit and says, come, let us live a new life. Leave your life of sin. 
And so we thank you, Lord, that even now that you are speaking to some of us, we know, Lord, there are thoughts and um, things that come to mind as we hear this, particular behaviours. And we pray, Father, as we come to your table this morning, we may know that Jesus sits with us. He calls us up out of our seat and gives us grace to do so. He calls us to receive his body and his blood as a sign of our participation, not only in his death, but also in his resurrection to life. And Lord, he calls us now to sit and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit that he so freely gives to us so that we may live a holy and indestructible life. Lord, set us free from the law that is always going to draw us into condemnation and help us to look to Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to uh, receive the Lord's Supper uh, now and so I'll invite those who are helping to serve uh, to come forward. Uh, This is a meal that Jesus has uh, set aside to feed his church. One of the reasons why we have communion weekly is because we so easily forget these things. And Jesus wants us not only to remember them in our heads, but to participate them physically with our bodies. And so Jesus is now present with us here to set us free from all that binds us and so that we might feed on him by faith. So all is ready. Come a bit closer to me, guys. So this is the table that Jesus has uh, set before his church so they might feed on him uh, by grace. And we remember the time when Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room and he was gathered around a, a table with them at the time of the Passover. The Passover remembered the time when God set the people free from slavery by a, uh, sacrificing a lamb and the blood was put on the doorposts. And when the angel of, of judgment of death came across the land at that moment, he saw the blood and passed over them. And he actually set them free from their slavery in Egypt and brought them into a new promised land. And Jesus comes at this feast as God present amongst us, not only to communicate to us that we are bound and in slavery for our sin, but as the one particularly who says, I'm going to be the one that sets you free from that if you put your faith and your trust in me. And so we remember at that meal where Jesus took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus also took the cup. And when he given thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we set this bread and this cup apart to the holy supper to which God calls us. If you are somebody who uh, has put your faith and trust in Jesus... Uh, we welcome you to, to come forward and receive of this, this uh, supper that Jesus has given. If you're not quite, quite at that point yet to, to put your, your trust in Jesus, know that this is for you. Jesus says, I'm going to set the whole world free. And the only thing that uh, may be preventing us from knowing the freedom that the Spirit wants to give to each one of us is by simply accepting and saying, Jesus, I'm going to give everything to you. Will you save me? And Jesus is here and he's saying to each one of us, then who has condemned you? No one. Well, neither do I condemn you. Come and receive the new life that I give to you and you will forever be with me. Father, we bless you for this meal and we thank you, Lord, that your spirit is here with us. We pray, Lord, for all of us as we come and receive the body and the blood of Christ. We may know the reality of his cleansing 
but all the reality of the life and the Holy Spirit gives to each one of us. May you affect a deep change in our hearts as we receive your supper today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we'll invite you to come forward. There will be three stations uh, over here in the middle and to, to the side. Um, if you can come forward, receive the elements and then go back to your seats. Um, and we'll do that as a um, safer COVID way as possible. Um, but this is the supper that the Lord has given to his church. Let us receive from him in faith. Amen.
just like to stand father we just thank you for your gift we just thank you that you have washed us clean we thank you that you invite us to be your children and that you have adopted us lord and we just pray that the words of this song lord would be our testimony first and foremost but then it would be our prayer that it, we would lean into these words lord and that we would be able to sing them with conviction father once we just um, are leaning into those, Lord. So we just give this to you, Lord. Precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame retreat this covenant is making me whole So I will rise and lift my head For by His mercy my life was spared The highest name 
has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean purify my heart in your presence teach me to discover the joy of holiness that forms as you draw me close in you what was lost is restored so I will rise and lift my head for by his mercy my life was spared the highest name has set me free because of jesus my heart is clean so let's sing that from the top it's a really easy melody precious blood has left me forgiven you're like the whitest of snow powerful to make sin and shame retreat this covenant is making me whole so I will rise and lift my head for by his mercy my life was spared the highest name has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean and purify my heart in your presence teach me to discover the joy of holiness that forms as you draw me close in you what was lost is restored so I will rise and lift my head for by his mercy my life was spared the highest name has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean so I will rise and lift my head for by his mercy my life was spared the highest name has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean because of Jesus my heart is clean thank you Lord in the darkness we were waiting without hope or without life till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt to the other side 
Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. salt only exemplifies the fact you are the salt of the earth <laughs> and if it makes you feel any better Jill and I in our early years of marriage followed a recipe that said put in a clove of garlic which we did except it was the whole corn of garlic <laughs> social And we've been reminded that through grace we are saved. And just how good is that? Amen. And if there's a way to exemplify that and show that to others, a member of our home group told us that when she was looking for a new church in which to worship, she couldn't work out how to suss it out. So she decided to park out the front after the service and watch the people coming out. And if they smiled, something good happened. So go out and smile at strangers and park cars. <laughs> Would I, can I remind you, please, of the uh, giving to the BDC and to our church. Uh, keep your giving uh, going. That is just lovely and necessary. A uh, cup of tea and coffee for all visitors, please. Do not attempt to pay for your coffee. That will be given to you free. Uh, and uh, please remain seated. Uh, after you've got the coffee, that is, get, come and sit down. And thank you for today. It was a lovely service. And thank you for the Elfords and their clan and for the Litchfields uh, for your uh, good memories for in this place. Simon, would you give the blessing? Uh, our hospitality team leader, 
uh, Rosie and Ray and Jill have provided a special morning tea for us this morning as well, so we can enjoy that as well. If anybody would like some prayer, if the Lord's spoken to you in any particular way, you just want to share that with another person or, or bring something to God in prayer, we would love to pray with you. And so we invite you to actually come forward. Or if you are comfortable with speaking to the person next to you, maybe just sit down with them and pray about that as well. But um, yeah, let's... A walk in the new life that Jesus has granted to each one of us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us now and always. Amen.